Coming up on Nebraska Stories, building UNL's football cathedral, the sport of old school corn husking. A Yazidi refugee finds food for his soul in the Nebraska dirt. And a toast to Kool-Aid, oh yeah. In Nebraska, the skyline is home to a college football cathedral. For 100 years, Memorial Stadium has become a place that has bound the state together. The origins of this Nebraska landmark can be traced to a post-World War I America, eager to honor those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. There was some national movement after World War I to build memorial structures. There were, you know, 20 or 30 schools in the process of building a memorial building. It was a movement that kind of swept through academia from coast to coast. They had really big plans for this building, right? And it was gonna have the memorial, uh, and that would be a rotunda area, colonnades. There would be a museum that you could put artifacts from the different war periods, because they'd started to think beyond just World War I. They were gonna have, the, of course, the football field, indoor track. So it really became this giant thing. Despite the initial designs and plans, in 1923, work began on just an east and west grandstand that would make up Memorial Stadium. It's very labor intensive to build a poured in place concrete building, which is exactly what the original Memorial Stadium is. It's the core of the stadium on the east and the west side. The construction company had 89 days to complete the project. Uh, they lost 31 days to weather, it was an issue. So it went up pretty fast. The design of the building is interesting in that it's very typical of its era. The late 19th and early 20th century saw architects and architecture in this country not exclusively, but heavily based in what is known today as neoclassical architecture. And here's where the Capitol and the, the stadium share some talent. The Capitol was started under construction a good year before Memorial Stadium was begun. And that was enough time to bring in a man from the university a PhD philosopher and head of that department at the university in the 1920s by the name of Dr. Hartley Burr Alexander. He was brought into the team and provided all the inscription, some in painted murals, some carved in stone. He provided images of what subject matter was to be in carvings on the outside of the building. He organized the entire thematic scheme, both on the exterior and the interior of the Capitol. He was asked by the university, you know, you're doing this for the Capitol. How about providing some work for us at the stadium, which he was glad to do. There are four corner pavilions and the two inscriptions on the east side of the building that face campus were dedicated as memorial statements to those who'd given their lives in service to the state and nation. In commemoration of the men of Nebraska who served and fell in the nation's wars, their lives they held, their country's trust, they kept its faith, they died its heroes. Since this facility was to be about sports as well, there were two inscriptions installed on the corner pavilions on the West Stadium. Not the victory, but the action, not the goal, but the game. In the deed, the glory, 
courage, generosity, fairness, and honor. And these are the true awards of manly sport. Anyone can build a stadium. What you put into it, what you say you stand for, is more a statement of who you are as a people. I mean, he, he darn well knew that. And so he chose statements on the face of the stadium, if you take time to read them, talk about the merit of the activities to go on inside the stadium. Not the win-loss record, but how you conduct yourself competing in those sports, representing our state. The stadium was essentially an east and a west stadium. The East Stadium, that which faced campus, was to be the main entrance. The real visual appearance of the stadium was oriented to the east, as it should be, the campus, where the students would enter, and that's still to this day the predominant student and faculty side of the stadium. The West Stadium, more the general public. And so the East Stadium and West were both clad with a facade. It had a whole series of arches along the exterior face of the building. And at the very center of the east side was this, this semi-dome, which was a semicircular recess into the face of the stadium with a half dome at the top of it. It had kind of coffers in it and bosses or, or flowers in the center of that, of that dome. So it was a, had some real uh, antecedents in Roman architecture. It was meant to be a very impressive, make no mistake about it, where the front entrance is kind of expression on that side of the building. It was a really quick build, really, because you're talking that, you know, they're groundbreaking in April of 1923, but they're playing games in October of 23. But again, that's where you had the field could be made available, certain sections of the stand could be available, but the entire stadium was not complete at that time. It still had wood frame holding the concrete. Uh, it looked a little too fresh to be safe, but I do think they tested it before they let people sit up there in the stands. And in fact, I think there's a note where um, Parsons Construction Company that was responsible for actually building the stadium, they just said, if you're gonna be having fans in the stands in October or on these games, we're not gonna be responsible for any injuries. The first game happened on October 13th in 1923, and that was against Oklahoma. Nebraska won that game fairly handily, I think uh, 24 to nothing or something like that. And uh, the interesting thing about that was that Nebraska wore blue jerseys that day because Oklahoma had only brought its red ones. And rather than have them both teams looking the same, Nebraska agreed to, uh, we'll do the blue jersey thing. So that's the only time that Nebraska ever didn't wear red um, in a game. And then the next game on October 20th against Kansas and Jayhawks is when it was actually dedicated. And at that time, they said it was 30,000 fans could come into the stadium. Now, sometimes, depending on the archival record that you're looking at, you might see that read as 31,000. And in fact, at one point, I found a, a citation where there was actually 47,000 possible seats in the stands because the intention was that you could bring in bleachers in an emergency situation. Nebraska had begun a new chapter on campus and within the football program. Even though the stadium wasn't quite finished, the first games played inside ushered in an era of winning football that only grew from there. It's a beautiful September Saturday in Nebraska, and these Huskers are preparing to take to the field. But they won't be slinging pigskin at Memorial Stadium. These fierce competitors are going old school in a battle of the bang boards at the annual Nebraska State Hand Corn Husking Contest. Well, somebody said there's gonna be a corn picking contest today, and I thought I'd join the crowd. Today's crowd is a bit smaller than during the heyday of corn picking contests, 
the 1936 National Championship in Ohio drew about 160,000 people. At the time, it was considered the fastest growing sport in the U.S. Sherman Henriksen of Rural Lincoln took home Nebraska's first national title, husking 38 bushels of corn in 1933. I'm a fairly competitive person and something like this, it's not super difficult, but it's pretty fun. Like once you really get into it, it's, it's a pretty fun uh, sport, I guess. Before farming became mechanized, shucking corn by hand and pitching ears into horse-drawn wagons was how harvesting was done. I grew up picking a load of corn with my dad every morning before school. Oh yes, I know what corn picking is. You want to keep your eyes on the ears of corn ahead of you. You never look at the wagon because your ears will tell you if the ear hits the bang board. And the way you do it, you pick it, you get it like this, and you don't throw it like this. You flip it. The big thing was 100 bushel a day. Boy, I'd like to get 100 bushel a day. And I did it once, only once. I was young, but I i think it might have been a little bit dark almost when I went out there. It was probably dark when I quit. Nebraska is one of nine states still holding corn husking contests, and it is a timed event. Depending on the class a picker is in, they can husk anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. Three, two, one, go. The person who picks the most weight of husk-free corn wins, and there's quite a process involved in deciding the winner. Nice. Nicely done. They empty the wagons into the big metal tubs. They weigh the metal tubs. And any gleanings that are in the bags they forgot to pick or they missed the wagon, those count against them also. And so you take the gross weight and you minus the ounces of the husk and the minus the pounds of the ears, and that's what they have for the day. Gothenburg and Holdridge have hosted the contest in the past, but it's found a permanent home at the Stir Museum in Grand Island. The event is important, certainly for the competitors, and we are very grateful for the competitors that are here. All of you should be very proud because right here where you stand, in this state is how we taught the world how to feed itself. Taking on the state hand corn husking contest presented some unexpected challenges to the Stir Museum. This event was in jeopardy of just falling off the face of the, the state, so to speak, and not being held. We didn't have some of the resources that we needed. So we partnered with several folks and uh, they came in strong and we were able to do it. Some of our growers helped us with the ground prep to get it ready for planting. The horse teams came in and broke all the, the sod and the prairie grass. I'd always loved farming and being around agriculture. For me, it's just a passion that, that I've always had. And I felt like with the last name of corn, I kind of had to do something in ag. So it was just a, a, a perfect fit. <laughs> We do living history at Stern Museum. That's what we're known for. And if this isn't living history, I don't know what is. I mean, it's, it's modern day interpretation of something that's happened 100 years ago. From a historical perspective, I desperately wanted this to happen here. And happen it did. I got first. Um, I think I got eight. 18 years, I think. I think. I picked 260 pounds of corn in 30 minutes. And then I placed third out of three, but I was pretty close for second. So, and they're both um, previous national champions. So, I felt like I did okay. I was tardy once in 13 years and 
never absent, so I made sure I went to school so I didn't have to pick corn all day. <laughs> <laughs> Dwayne Frazier, he had a gross weight of 39 pounds. He had uh, 0.5 ounces of husks against him, and he had 3.2 pounds of ears against him. I think history is kind of a big part of our, of our world. Our generation is really straying away from uh, the old techniques and manual labor, and I think it's fun to look back and see how the older generations used to farm this land and make their money. At a weekly produce stand at a Lincoln farmer's market, Shahab Bashar helps his customers find just the right fresh ingredients. Green peppers and tomatoes, or more specialized items like pickling peppers and shishitos. Yeah, what are these big purple things? It's daikon radish. Shahab helped grow this produce as part of a nonprofit called Community Crops, designed to help people grow their own food. If you just Come on, look, it's here, it's really beautiful tomato, almost ready. Shahab also works part-time at Community Crops as the Yazidi cultural liaison. So, how are we gonna reserve, I mean, eggplant for the, I mean, winter? When we don't have eggplant, yeah. we use this eggplant. Providing interpreting and translation assistance, including advice on how to get the most out of Nebraska soil, which differs from the sandier soil of his homeland in northern Iraq. When you are growing stuff, eating from it, you put something from the soil inside your blood. Then there will be a relation between your, your soul and this land. Shahab is part of Lincoln's Yazidi refugee community, a non-Muslim ethno-religious minority many of whom, like Shahab and his family, were forced to flee from Iraq after multiple genocides. Lincoln is home to some 3,000 Yazidis, the largest such community in the U.S. My wife, my daughter, she was two years. We are survivor for genocide 2014, happened to Yazidis. Shahab and his family served as translators with the U.S. Army in Sinjar, Iraq, before receiving visas to come to the U.S., joining Lincoln's growing Yazidi community in 2017. With the trauma of the genocide back home and the culture shock of their new home, the family struggled to adjust. I used to run a school in Iraq, so I, I was a principal for a school. When I came to the United States, I couldn't find a job. Part of the culture shock had to do with food. Pickling people, it's like sweet people, but couldn't find in the market. The foods from the bigger stores taste like plastics. No, no taste, actually, no smell, no taste. That's when Shahab and Community Crops launched the effort to find the seeds to grow food that is culturally important to the Yazidi community. So we started growing. We, we had a little farm. And that, and, uh, we become part of this land. When Shahab isn't tending rows, wow. he's helping other immigrants and refugees right. navigate some of the same struggles he and his family faced. At the Yazidi Cultural Center, I have a couple clients speaking of Kurdish from Turkey. I have clients from Syria. I have clients from Iran. I have clients from different Arabic countries. Okay, I'm, I'm Banshi Barigania. We speak Arabic, we speak Kurdish, Kurmanji, and uh, we speak English. So we, we mostly help people in our community. They are struggling with the, with the English. Friend and fellow Yazidi refugee, Nawaf Haskan, was also an interpreter for the U.S. military. I used to run this place as an executive director, and, but now I'm a board member, and I constantly come here and think there are a few things that this place can do for people, for the community. Uh, one of them, you know, help them with the daily 
staff, you know, applying for a job, uh, you know, in the need of interpretation. 6,000 miles from Sinjar, food is key to preserving cultural traditions in his own family. Both Nawaf and his wife, Layla, are skilled chefs cooking elaborate feasts from unwritten recipes passed down from one generation to the next. At their home in Lincoln, the camera eats first, so Nawaf can post images to his Instagram site, Yazidi Kitchen in America. I have a two, almost a two-year-old twin girls to teach them if we were back home in, in Sinjar, it will be easy. You know, I wouldn't teach them about all the culture because they will, everybody is practicing the same culture, but also we don't want to forget where they came from. Over aromatic plates of dolma, lamb stuffed kutelk dumplings, and pickled shishito peppers, Nawaf and Shahab are not just planting seeds, they're planting a future in the U.S. with their growing families. I think through agriculture and through getting that taste of the land, taste of the soil, it's connect you to the area more than if you're not planting. Shahab says his farm and the culinary traditions it inspires only strengthens the connection of his soul to the Nebraska soil. We're feeling good when we encourage people to grow food, eat healthy, and uh, you could support your family with some foods. I, I, don't, I couldn't express even the land when you grow food, when you eat from these foods, you love this land. Shahab likens his existence to that of a tree or a plant, part of the land here, ready to grow roots in his new home. In 1900, David Perkins opened a general store in the village of Henley. It became a central hub in the community, and helping David run the store was his 11-year-old son, Edwin. Edwin was a curious kid who spent his spare time doing science experiments. Eventually, Edwin began creating products to sell in the family store. In 1918, he invented Nixotine, a remedy he declared cured tobacco habits. Edwin targeted advertising for Nixotine toward veterans, and it turned into a great success. The profit from sales allowed Edwin to move to Hastings, where he spent more time developing new products. One was a fruit-flavored concentrated drink Edwin called Fruit Smack. It was an instant hit, not only in Nebraska, but in neighboring states too. But as the popularity of his new drink grew, Edwin was confronted with a big problem. Fruit Smack was packaged in glass bottles that often broke during shipping. He struggled to find a solution. And then, in 1926, Edwin attended a food manufacturing convention. There, he learned about a new food preservation method. Inspired by Jell-O, he invented a powdered formula for Fruit Smack and gave it a new name, Kool-Aid. Within three years, Kool-Aid was distributed across the United States. Edwin was also innovative when it came to advertising. He packaged Kool-Aid in vibrant colors with images of children on the envelopes, which appealed to young consumers. He also displayed Kool-Aid in colorful, eye-catching boxes and called this method of selling the silent salesman. Although not everything was smooth sailing. In the middle of Kool-Aid's success, Perkins did have to change the spelling of his famous product in order to meet new regulations but that didn't stop the momentum that was built. By 1939, Kool-Aid was rated as the seventh most popular soft drink in the country. This allowed for the General Food Corporation to buy Perkins Product Company. And that's when Kool-Aid popped. Oh yeah! Kool-Aid became the center of pop culture. A five-cent package does the trick. Makes two quarts of Kool-Aid quick. Hey, Kool-Aid! is for kids and big first. From the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 
and the 2000s. The Kool-Aid brand was on everything and anything you could think of, from hats and children's toys to shirts and even action figures. Kool-Aid even branches out to different food products, such as ice cream and even cakes. Everyone across the country knew what Kool-Aid was and couldn't get enough of it. Nearly 100 years later, Kool-Aid remains a well-known brand available worldwide. Watch more Nebraska Stories on our website, Facebook, and YouTube. Nebraska Stories is funded in part by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation.